um, as you know, we have asked you to um, uh, watch the tutorials uh, beforehand and read up on some training materials beforehand. And then um, um, we've organized this session especially to for you to uh, ask questions about uh, either the tutorials or the training materials. I noticed that with us is uh, apart from Emily Hermans, who will be presenting. So it's not Francoise Van Doorn, but she is on a different computer. Um, but Emily Hermans, who is presenting, and I've seen that Sarah Jones from DCC has joined us as well. Um, so that means that at least two, um, two experts of uh, Open Air and Foster are here to answer all of your questions. Um, a little bit of housekeeping is, uh, first of all, the session is being recorded. So um, we will uh, send you the recordings afterwards. Um, you can um, ask your questions uh, either via uh, the, our Mentimeter uh, presentation, which uh, means that you should go to menti.com and use the code uh, 17, um, 178158. So you can just type in your question, uh, your question there. But of course, uh, we'll also looking be looking at the chat. So you can also uh, just type in your question in the chat box of this uh, this presentation uh, of this uh, webinar, and then um, uh, we'll answer them uh, in chronological order as they come. Um, I'm muting you all, so um, please don't unmute yourself because I think we're a bit too many to allow uh, for people to just talk. Um, uh, at their own judging, but if you really think it's better to uh, to talk, just ping me in chat, and and uh, we can unmute you so that you have um, that we can have a real conversation. Uh, in any case, uh, Emily, I would say um, the floor is yours, um, and um, I would say if, if people have questions, please um, please short, start uh, typing them in chat or uh, in the menti.com. Okay, thank you, Gwen. So this is a Q&A session and questions and answer session. So I uh, will not be um, presenting. Um, so there was uh, one question already about the new um, framework program of the EC. Um, and the question was, what do we know already about it? Um, is there already some news about the policy? Um, at this stage, it's a little early to say. Um, the new program will start in January uh, 2021. So that's two years ago, uh, two years away. There has been a press release. And what it say in regards to open access and open science is that it will be uh, Open science will be the default option. So they will continue the way that uh, the program has been going now. So open access will be the default for open access to publication and also for data to, um, to allow innovation um, and, and um, spreading of results. So we uh, suspect that, that uh, there will be a continuation of the current policy but it's too early to say and we'll have more news in 2019 probably um if you want to keep up to date you can always su subscribe to the open air newsletter uh, we always report on on new policies um gwen i think my screen is shared at the moment uh, shall i open the oh. mentimeter uh, question no yeah your um your screen is not shared at this point so I think okay. it's... Um... So I hope and hope that uh, answered the question about um, the next framework program. Do you know if there are more questions? Um, I don't see the Mentimeter at the moment. Um, if you want to, I can I can share my screen for now. That's fine, but I don't. Uh, maybe maybe if people wait, I have Mentimeter open on my screen, but um, maybe if people have questions, they can also just ask them in chat. Um, mm -hmm. Mentimeter was mainly useful for uh, for asking questions in advance. So, are there any questions? Uh, you're all very quiet in the chat room in the chat box. So.
maybe it's helpful to get a sense of the audience. So yeah. are, are most of you supporting open access and open data? And I mean, do you get inquiries regularly from researchers about these things? Okay, so I do recognize some names in the in the audience in the, in the attendee list, but some people I don't know. So it would be useful if you could tell us, if you could share with us what your experiences are with uh, disseminating news about policies. Okay, so Claire Austin from Environment Canada. It's good that we've got global reach, not just European reach, um, and they support open science. Um, Claire, do you get any questions about Horizon 2020 policies? I think one thing just while, while people are typing in kind of questions or, or comments on on what they do just to follow on from what emily mentioned earlier on about the horizon 2020 or the, the next framework program and how horizon 2020 policies will will potentially change um gwen and i were doing some training workshops for foster the other week um helping ec project officers on how to review data management plans and one of the comments that was made to them in some internal training was that it's likely a, a DMP will be compulsory in future. Um, so regardless of whether people are sharing data or not, uh, they think the DMP will be needed um, to address the data management. And I think if that does transpire into policy, I think that would be a good step. So I think the, the DMP can be quite useful to the project itself. Mm -hmm. Sarah, will you, do you expect that there will be any guide, more guidance about DMPs from the European Commission? Or will this be something that will be left to the to the national uh, to national level? Um, I I think the EC potentially will have you know a bit more guidance. I think it'd be useful if they shared guidance on how they're reviewing the DMPs. That's something we've recommended in a report that Open Air did with the Fair Data Expert Group. Um, they they have an internal framework which isn't public, but it's based on their own template. So essentially, you will all know what the coverage is. Um, but I think if they explained a bit more about their internal processes and maybe gave some more discipline-specific guidance, that would be useful. And I know they're they're keen to have more discipline-specific guidance, but I think they may try and collaborate with others, like the Science Europe Consortium or maybe some of the ESFRIs so that it, it's not necessarily the commission releasing this but um they hopefully support it being developed elsewhere okay thanks okay so, so are there, are, yeah sorry sorry go ahead i, I was i was going to ask a question to the audience um do you find one aspect of the EC's policy easier to deal with, like the open access side? Is that easier than the open data? Are there particular challenges that you face? Uh -huh. Okay, so there's a question uh, whether there are any guidelines regarding human data. Um, I think um, on um, um, I'm not sure, Sarah. You can you can go into that in detail. I know I do know that on Thursday we also have a webinar um, hosted by um, well given by by Chesda and, and Jesses who will deal with the legal and ethical aspects of sharing uh, data and the social sciences. Um, but Sarah, maybe you can tell you you know a bit more about that and uh, you yeah. can share right now. Um, the the EC policy is quite generic. Um, there's there's kind of two main sets of guidelines around the data side. Um, there's the guidelines on fair data management in Horizon 2020, and then there's also an overarching open access and 
um, open data guide, um, which covers both areas. And I, th I think because the commission funds every type of research, it's not, it doesn't go into lots of detail on, you know, how you handle human data. But one of the things they do stress with their, you know, open by default policy is that that's meaning that you should be as open as possible. So where there are sensitivities around the data or a need to share under restrictions or through data sharing agreements, that's completely permissible. That's that's not an issue. It just needs to be outlined in, in the DMP what the what the plan is. In terms of handling human data, I think the more comprehensive guidelines come from actual data services. So I know in the UK, um, the UK data service, UKDA, um, they have a lot of really comprehensive guidelines on negotiating consent um, and anonymizing data uh, and using, um, you know, different different types of services like secure data services. So their guidelines would be a lot more specific than the EEC's, which is probably a better kind of port of call if you're looking for more practical advice. Uh, you can paste a link to, to that website in the chat. Mm -hmm. Okay, Sarah said there was another message, but I'm not not sure if you've seen it because it was was sent in private to organizers. And um, it's by Erin Finnerty, and and she says the following: um, Our team is researching. Um, oh, maybe Emily, if you're okay, uh, I will just copy the the question into the chat so that everybody can read it. Okay. Erin, um, uh, sorry, yeah. So. Um, I think it's related to the to the question uh, previous question as well. So it says our team is researching uh, young mental health, and I think there are concerns that sharing uh, data, the sharing of this information is too sensitive in nature to have full open access to research data. Yes. Yes, ours are keen to comply with open data, but do you have any advice for sharing of sensitive information or what the policy is regarding data concerning minors? Our team is re researching uh, youth mental health and I think there are concerns. Okay, that is, uh, okay, policies regarding minors, okay. Yeah, um, so ag again, I think the thing that I would stress is that the EC's policy, although it's open by default, it's that that means that you make what that you make make data open wherever you can so it doesn't mean that everything has to be open it might be that within your project there are certain data sets or certain elements of data that you can make openly available and then others where you know there's a risk of disclosure or there's sensitivities because you're you're working with minors or potentially you haven't got consent to share that data um so i, I think the key thing where where you're working with you know more complex or challenging data sets in terms of sharing is first off to to see what consent you can get so to ask whether there's if the participants will allow you to share the data to reuse it in other studies obviously to anonymize the data if you are going to be sharing it um, and if if anonymizing the data would um, you know essentially strip away too much of the inf valuable information that would allow you to reuse it and to make the data meaningful then maybe you have much more um, restrictive sharing so you have data sharing agreements that either constrain who can use the data or for what purpose now that's not open data sharing but it's still sharing in some form and that's better than no sharing at all um, and I think the other thing that for the EC's policy because they talk about open data but they're also really now emphasizing fair data um, I think it's really valuable to make sure there's metadata online, even if the data themselves can't be accessible to all, there should still be a metadata record so people know about the research you've done and they know there's some data there and potentially they have to get in touch with the investigators and, you know, agree to a data sharing agreement to be able to reuse it, but there's still a big value in knowing that that data exists. So yeah, I think the main thing I'd stress about the data policy is that it's it's a scale. You know, it doesn't mean that everything has to be open. You know, there's different shades of grey, and it's for every project to apply that policy as applicable for their data. Okay, thank you very much, Sarah. Um, I, I would just I'm, I'm 
sharing my screen um, just to show you that we will we will have later this week uh, we will have some other webinars related to both research data management in general and and fair data and also um, uh, legal and ethical considerations for sharing research data. So if you're more interested in this topic, uh, I would suggest that you also uh, that you also attend uh, these webinars and uh, definitely watch the tutorials and uh, and read the training materials. Um, in the meantime, there are some questions um, from the Mentimeter. Um, so the first one is a is a bit of a philosophical one. So do you think the EC is actually making a difference in open access and open science? Um, um yeah mm -hmm. yes um i think if i i speak from my experience uh i work at the university in the in the library um i can say that policy definitely definitely has an impact on awareness um so as you know um uh, libraries are most often the ones paying for subscriptions and things like that that's uh, so that means that the costs of, of uh, publishing um, is often a little bit hidden from, from researchers. And now with the whole movement of uh, open access and also definitely open data, uh, researchers are more and more aware of how the system works and why it's important that um, science needs to be open. And I think DEC has um, made a lot of progress possible for, for um for the open science movement um, in terms of awareness, in terms of um, trying to be a, a force that moves forward in, in this sense. It's, it's no longer um, uh, just the libraries or just a small group of open science advocates who, who are behind this um, policy. More and more um, national policies, more and more university policies adapt to the open science policies of the EC. And I think in, in that way, the EC is actually making difference in, in open science. Um, I don't know if you want to supplement, Quinn, or... Uh, um... Well, I think, first of all, the budget is quite significant. So the mm -hmm. EC is, I think, worldwide one of the greatest funders. Uh, I'm not sure about the exact amount, but it's over, I think, Horizon 2020 was over 80 billion euros. So um, in any case, this is, um, if, I mean, the, the mandate is, is, is quite like a strong one in, in uh, regarding the number, the sheer number of projects and, and, and publication, that, uh, publication it actually influences. So I do think that they make a difference. And, and on a more philosophical level or on a more um, like highbrow, highbrow level I think um, the type of policy that the EC has been has been establishing for quite a quite a while especially in the begin days was um, where, where with a focus on depositing uh, in a repository uh, and, and making it open as soon as possible um, I think this was a the fact that that EC adopted this type of mandate has inspired a lot of local uh, local funders and institutions to do the same I yeah. see that somebody in the chat also said um, that they believe there's a difference in open data and open science. So Claire, maybe if you have some more uh, context on your statement, that would be nice to share. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I think there's been a huge shift with the EC policy. When you look at the different institutions across Europe and you know how many local policies or national funder policies are emerging, kind of following on from the EC stance, um, and also just the investment that member states are making as well. So individual universities, you know, having local support teams, I think that's really shifted over the last few years. And I think it's in light of European Commission because people realize that their researchers and applicants need support. Um, and like Gwen says, they, they provide a significant amount of funding to research, but also they fund a lot of infrastructure projects, you know, projects like Open Air, um, and that similarly makes a big difference. Hi, it's Claire here. Um, thank you for, for doing this and for welcoming uh, people uh, from across the pond. Uh, yeah, I do think that the, the EC European Commission uh, is making a difference. Uh, I've been reading uh, many of the, uh, the uh, documents, uh, directives and so on that have come out, especially over the last six months. Uh, so we have the um, 
the EC's open science policy um, platform recommendations, um, the European Open Science Cloud, uh, and then um, in various countries have been putting forth uh, uh, national plans. Of France, for example, uh, uh, the national plan on um, open on um, open science as part of the uh, open government uh, partnership. So uh, these are, from, from my my perspective, are very forward looking. And uh, helped uh, are are, are uh, influential in, in in moving the open science open science forward globally. I believe. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Very, thank you very much, uh, Claire. That's very very useful. Um, there is one one uh, other question in the in the Mentimeter. Uh, unless somebody something has something to add, Sarah or Emily. Nothing, uh, nothing specifically. It's just I, I think it's good that well, it shows the impact of Europe that people from across the pond are coming to these webinars, you know, because yeah. they see it as an influential thing to track the developments of. So it's nice to see that kind of global transition. Yeah, indeed. Um, and another question is, and, and this is something that I will answer very quickly, and it is does Open Air plan to support a new round of post grant APC? Um, in short, no, uh, and it's mainly for those of you who are not aware, Open Air um, supported a, um, a fund that covered uh, open access fees uh, related to FP7 projects, uh, and, and, and that was in, in the previous round of a uh, version of Open Air. Um, so this is not so, this is not something that uh, will we continue to do, and the main reason for that is that actually open access fees are um, an eligible cost in a uh, project in Horizon 2020 and project uh, writing. So you're supposed, as a pro if you uh, submit a proposal, you're supposed to uh, calculate the costs, uh, the potential cost of open access fees and, and, and just uh, include them in your proposal. So there's no real need for a separate fund covering this. Um, and maybe I can just quickly go to the next question as well. And those questions have been asked by the Mentimeter. Uh, so uh, so why, what if I can't afford open access fees? And, and I just, um, I think this is, a, this is a, an important question. Um, but maybe Emily, you can, uh, you can elaborate a little bit on what people should do um, if they don't have the budget to pay and if they mm -hmm. didn't write it into their project proposal. Mm -hmm. um, yes, maybe I'll quickly share my screen. Yeah, sure. Um, can I just click screen? Yes. Can you see? Do you see on top that that you can share your screen, or should you? Should I? I will make mm. you. No, sorry. I mean, I need to make you presenter. Here you are. Yes. Yes. <laughs> yes. Now it should work. Okay. Yes, there you go. So can you see me see? Okay. Oh, it doesn't go to the slide on this. Okay, let's quickly go over it. So as Gwen said, um, the initial idea is that uh, um, you plan for open access costs in your in your budget. So uh, costs for open access publishing are uh, eligible costs. Uh, now, of course, if you make all your publication open access through an open access journal, uh, especially in some in some uh, areas, this can be expensive. So it's a good idea to to combine uh, strategies. Um, the open access journals, um, often called the gold open access, um, if if they ask for for high fees, um, you can also opt for um, a, a, a subscription-based journal, so that's still okay. You do not need to op to publish in an, in an open access journal. You can choose, but uh, you always need to self-archive. So um, if you do not have the funds, you can choose choose for a, a closed um, subscription-based journal. But then um, you need to self-archive mm -hmm. in a repository. And uh, most universities have repositories. 
uh, most research institutions have repositories for uh, for publications. Um, but if you do not have a repository or cannot find a repository, there are uh, lists with repositories, or you can use Zenodo, for example, which is the European funded repositories for publication and data. Um, so it, it is possible to make your publication open access uh, without any costs. Um, you should uh, check uh, your, your publisher's policy if you do that. So uh, most, most journals allow this. This is a common practice, good practice. Um, but they, it, it's possible that they uh, ask for an embargo so that you can deposit your um, publication in a repository but that you can all only make it open after six months. This is also not a problem. So there's an exception uh, that allows an embargo of six months for open access. Uh, and for the social science and humanities, this embargo is, is longer, so that's 12 months. So if you, if you do not have the budget, um, I would recommend to self-archive in a repository uh, and also look around for, for journals because there are several open access journals that, that do not ask for an for a article processing fee or that have very low open access article fees or that, um, that uh, have waivers or things like that. So these are, these are the options if you, if you do not have, have the fees. Emily, um, maybe it is worth mentioning, um, because I think people might wonder about the, the implication of something like uh, initiatives like Plan S. Uh, I don't think we mm -hmm. need to discuss this right now, because uh, on Thursday there is a webinar with uh, Marina Angelaki, who's, who's going to give an update on most recent pol policy developments and the likely mm -hmm. influence of, of initiatives like Plan S. Uh, as you know, this is... Uh, an initiative by, by I think 11 funders in Europe who will who actually are, are more radical than what is the European Commission is propo proposing right now. So um, there will be um, yeah the, the embargo periods for example will be not um, um, but well uh, this will will be abandoned if if this goes through. But as it is an, until now quite unclear um, what the consequences will be, and it's definitely not applicable for Horizon 2020 publications yet. So um, I'm not sure if anybody has any. Um, uh, maybe Sarah, you have any updates on that? But I don't think I don't think there are at this point. We're all waiting a bit to see what the practical uh, uh, implications will be. Yeah, I don't have specific updates on that. Um, there's one more question. I, I mean, Garrett has posed a question in the chat box, so maybe we can uh, we can deal with that one first. Um, and that is a question um, because our open access policy for literature has been around for quite a while. Um, building on this, uh, for Horizon 2020 can draw on that experience to implement whatever policy emerges. Uh, and there is a mature repository infrastructure to uh, accommodate and. Um, uh, AM, I'm not sure what that means, um, and the preprint route, and to uh, an evolving business model from publishers. Um, the concern that I've encountered is that a similar infrastructure for the long-term preservation of research data is not quite there yet, at institutional or national level. For an open science policy to be effective, uh, this infrastructure gap will have to be bridged. What is likely to emerge to help us achieve this? So uh, I think, uh, in summary, will there be an equally robust uh, data repository infrastructure um, will this emerge in order to support this open science policies? Yeah, um, I, I think you you hit on an important point, Garrett, because um, like you say, there are a lot of publication repositories and actually it's, I think, handling the types of publications, because it's quite a lot, you know, it's very similar um, what's being deposited. I think that's a simpler task than dealing with, you know, a wide variety of different types of research data. So having a data repository is a more challenging thing to provide as a service. And um, there are definite gaps in the infrastructure. Um, and one of the recommendations we make in the Fair Data Expert Group report is that, you know, there has to be investment to plug the gaps in the existing infrastructure and there also has to be um, support put in place so that those repositories a can can get certifications um, but also that they have 
kind of strategic and sustainable funding from funders or, or via other business models so that we know that they can preserve the data in the long term because a lot of pro lot of repositories are actually on soft kind of project money and that isn't a way to ensure that the data is available long term um i think one of my concerns in this area is is the growth of kind of publisher services to handle the data management for you or to to handle the data deposit um, and I think we maybe need a little bit more well, uh, more reassurances about what will happen with that data in the long term to make sure that we're not just handing over the rights to the data and being charged for that in future the way we are charged for, for publication access. Yeah, thanks, thanks, Sarah. Um, Garrett is also I, on Wednesday. We have Marian Grootveld from Dance talking about trusted data repositories. So that might also be of interest for the people who um, who want to know more about uh, um, data repository infrastructures. Um, another an, another route, uh, you know, like another field of question is that: Do you expect that the EU intellectual property directives will support or follow open science goals? Uh, I think this is a very interesting question because with the recent commotion about the copyright directive and, and uh, in general being considered as not being very open science friendly. Um, Emily or Sarah, are you comfortable talking about <laughs> talking about <laughs> this? Yeah. Look, yeah, copyright and legal stuff isn't my expert area. Um, so I'm not fully versed in all the changes there. Um, I mean, we were involved in doing a response with Spark Europe to kind of pick up on on some of the aspects. Um, and I think it's important that, you know, we, we stress the importance of, of data sharing, but you probably know more about the specific details than I do. Well, I think it's clear that, that current yeah, legislation is not always suitable especially when it comes to things like text and data mining and, and, mm -hmm. and um yeah you know the, the right to read and the right is the right to mine things like that it's, it's not not self-evident yet um i'm thinking about what who about what source i should refer you to if you want to know more about that um hold on i'm going to i'm going to look for it so maybe um if there are any other questions in the meantime we can uh, we can deal with those Yes, it's Claire here. Uh, I do have a question. Um, question comment. Uh, I'm a, a research scientist, so I'm very familiar with uh, publishing in the traditional uh, peer-reviewed journals. Um, with the uh, evolving policy uh, with the Government of Canada, Environment Canada, uh, we are freer now to publish in uh, non-traditional -trad non venues. Uh, attempted recently to uh, uh, put a preprint in one of the preprint servers. Uh, so while we support this uh, policy, uh, the devil is in the details. And when you come along to actually try and do it, uh, it's not tricky. <laughs> it, it's, it's not evident. And there, there are a number of uh, frustrations to overcome. So for example, uh, by the way, I work in a policy shop now. I work in the Science and Technology uh, Strategies uh, Directorate. So, trying to do this as a as a prototype or or uh, you know, well, nail down a detailed workflow. Uh, one of the issue, one of the many issues that I uh, came up against was um, since we uh, work for a government and uh, a crown, uh, then there's the added complication of crown copyright. I imagine that uh, national governments who uh, are not under a crown have uh, similar uh, copyright policies also. So the, the crown does not transfer copyright. And uh, so take example, if I were <coughs> uh, wanted to something on archive or bioarchive, uh, there is a, a clear mechanism for selecting a Creative Commons license, but not a crown license. Uh, unlike some of the, uh, the tr traditional journals, when an author, university professor, for example, uh, submits uh, an article, then you sign, you, you transfer your ownership of uh, copyright on the, uh, with the, uh, the journal uh, copyright form, and typically there is an option 
for uh, um, authors uh, uh, who actually don't own the copyright because it's owned by the Crown, and the traditional journals uh, accept that. So there's a gap uh, uh, going the non-traditional route, <laughs> um, and I, I couldn't solve it uh, at the time, and so I ended up putting it um, on GitHub and linking it to Zenodo in order to get a, a DOI. But still, the details of the Crown Copyright are not, uh, are how to handle the Crown Copyright are not clear, and I, I expect that there would be uh, similar instances um, in uh, in Europe. So I was wondering if anyone has any experience with that, uh, and if they found any uh, solutions or anyone's developed a, a workflow. Thank you. Oh. Thank you. Thank you very much for for the stare. This is a this is a very interesting perspective. Does anybody else wants to wants to share their experience or or their their thoughts on this? Okay. So um, I know uh, again I'm plugging one of our other webinars, but on Thursday we have a guest webinar um, by Open Minted or Open Minded, and and I know they've been working a lot around uh, TDM and uh, text and data mining and copyright, so maybe that would be worth attending. And um, maybe Sarah or Emily, we do know some other projects or or sources for of information, right? I think uh, Create from Glasgow University, they're they're working a lot about copyright and intellectual property. And open science, do, you, do they have a list of resources? Um, yeah, I think they do. Um, so I know they've developed some training materials and kind of like um, uh, different kind of um, cards and things to try and demystify some of the issues. I, I'm not sure if they've got something specifically on the type of workflow you're looking for there, um, but we can certainly add details to create in the oh you've put it already in the chat well done Gwen thank you okay yeah so please if, if anybody in the in the audience has some more experience please share it because it's I think it's a it's sometimes this whole copyright and, and the copyright and intellectual property tends to be a bit of a black box and 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 um but we always feel it's useful to to hear different experiences and and also to learn about like the relative importance that is uh, that is being given to this topic in, in different fields and in different uh, different countries. So if you have any more experiences, uh, please just drop it in the chat. Um, I I don't see any updated questions on on Mentimeter. I'm not sure if anybody who's now in the who's still in the audience uh, does have a new. Uh, there are any other questions or any new topics that they want to um, that they want to um, broach or or just uh, any specific questions for Emily about her tutorials? I think it's okay to speak as well, so maybe you do, you, do, you can just unmute yourself and talk. Okay, um, if this means that there are no more questions um, from from you in the audience, um, I'm not sure, Emily, do you or Sarah, do you want to add something or do you want to give something to our, uh, to the audience of this, um, of this session? Any final words of advice? <laughs> <laughs> I, I think use the support that's there. So use the open air, um, network of national open access desks. Um, you've got contacts in every country. So if you do have questions around Horizon 2020 on the open access or open data side, you can get support there. And also through the Foster Project, you've got training materials. Um, so I just encourage you to make the best use of that support and kind of if you do get complicated questions, pass them off and try and get advice elsewhere if, if you're not sure about how to respond. 
uh, I don't want to take up so much space, but since the, the, there seems to be a, a lot of silence out there, I do have another question. Yeah. Okay. Um, so the question is, is uh, with respect to DOIs. And I'm wondering, mm -hmm. uh, when one publishes in uh, one of these non-traditional uh, venues, take, for example, um, uh, Zenodo. So Zenodo issues a, a DOI. What happens... Uh, if the article then goes on to be published in a traditional journal, uh, is there some kind of linkage or tracking um, uh, when when you have different DOIs pointing to the same the same resource, the same article? So, for example, a preprint or something on Zenodo, and then and then the final um, uh, peer-reviewed article in a journal. Well, I know that at least on Zenodo, you can re put related DOIs. So, um, actually, I don't know if we can bring up the interface share screen and show the interface, but you can flag a relation so you can say that this other object has been cited in the paper or is an earlier version of the paper, or um, I don't know if it lists preprint as one of those relations, but there's a whole category of relationships that you can flag. Um, I think if it was the exact same object, you know, if you were depositing in two repositories, I'd try not to have two DOIs to the very same thing. Try and just actually provide the DOI as part of a deposit. You know, if you had to, if your um, repository at your university forced you to have a copy there as well as your publisher copy, try to make sure you just mm -hmm. use the same DOI if it's exactly the same object. So the, the publisher, the uh, a traditional period of journal, the publisher will issue a new DOI, is that correct? I think that depends, actually, um, because yeah, yeah an example of yeah. on Zenodo. You do have and publishers then, who actually just use Zenodo as as archive as well. So I'm not sure if we can say like if you can have like one blanket statement for all publishers. Right. Um, well, I'm sure not. <laughs> If it can be of help, I just brought up uh, an article on the Zenodo blog about DOI versioning of by Zenodo in itself. So that might be an interesting, okay. uh, interesting read. Uh, right. Yeah, I can. I, I cannot really give any more more specific answers. Uh, we can get you in touch with with people at behind Zenodo if that's if that's something that you want to discuss more in depth. Sure, I'd appreciate that. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Any other questions? So um, I'll put up here a link to uh, the preprint that I was talking about. Um, And um, the, the other question is about, you know, we, we, we support uh, 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 the concept of open science and, and moving toward fair data and so on. But again, the devil is in the details. So both from the point of view of the data provider, where the data have not been collected and managed uh, actually um, with the concept of open science as an end goal. Uh, so then when you come to after the fact, uh, want to publish your data? Uh, it's it's not it's not evident that these data are going to be easily usable uh, mm -hmm. from a known user. Uh, conversely, when using other people's data that have not been prepared uh, with the idea of fair data, it becomes uh, uh, sometimes problematic. So I'll put the link. Oh no, I can't put the link because my computer just died. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, but there, uh, sorry about that. Um, but it, it is in Zenodo. It's um, if you search for um, in quotes a path to big data readiness, uh, you'll find the okay. preprint talking about. So within quotes, a path to big data readiness in Zenodo it was okay. put up uh, last week. Okay. It sounds sounds very relevant to the topics here. Thanks. Hold on. Could you type it in chat because I didn't, or or oh no, it's not possible because your computer died. Sorry. Um, Sarah, yeah. <laughs> did you catch the full title? Yeah. Mhm. Mm there you go. Ah, uh, okay. Hold on.
so just while Gwen pulls that up, does anyone else have any final questions? I'll Gareth put the link in the chat to the article. Thank you. Right. Okay. So thank you very much for this uh, for this Claire. This is this is very interesting. Uh, anybody else who wants to chip in? No. Well, in that case, I think I think I will I will close this uh, close this session. Um, and and I would first of all like to thank you very much for um, for listening in and for uh, asking asking uh, us your questions. Um, I hope it was, uh, despite this not being like a traditional webinar format, I hope this was uh, interesting for you. Uh, feel free to share the tutorials and uh, training materials uh, with whomever you think this might be of interest in your institution um, or um, or elsewhere. Um, we, would, we would really like to see these uh, broadly distributed. And if you have any additional questions about this webinar, about any of the others, um, you could either go to the overview page, uh, which you found because because you're here, um, or you can also get in touch with us uh, directly at um, webinars at uh, openair.eu. So uh, if you have any questions that now didn't come into spring into mind, but that, that you think of later, feel free to just contact us via this and we will connect you with the speakers here or with somebody else at Openair or Foster who can answer your question. Um, so thank you very much. Thank you very much, Emily. Thank you for making the tutorials, for taking the time, <laughs> for taking the time of doing this. And no thank problem. you very much to Sarah from DCC for being present here as well. Uh, and I'm looking forward to seeing um, seeing you all in, in uh, more of our other webinars that we'll be hosting uh, later this week. Thank you very much. Thanks all. Bye-bye. Thank you. Yep. Bye. Bye.